Yo, 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 live on location. Me and the blackest one are here in Orlando, still staying our asses at home. This week, we got a special, special guest, man. We got a two-time Olympian gold medalist. Legend. We got my man, a legend in this game. Did big boy things, big boy numbers. Put it on your favorite point guard. Please believe it. We got Darren, don't call me Deron. D. Williams in the building. <laughs> Live on location. He in Dallas, but these, these AT&T towers keep us connected. What's up, fam? Appreciate you joining us. Man, I appreciate y'all having me, man. I've been watching y'all for, from afar. Been a fan of the podcast. I'm glad y'all can have me on here. You know, this, this is big for us, man. We watched you your whole career, so you know, we definitely got to have you on our show where we doing so. I appreciate y'all having me. Yes, sir. Brought to you by AT&T. 5G. So the first question we ask everybody who come on the show is, when you first got to the league, who was the first person to bust your ass? Let me hear it. <clears throat> you know what's crazy is, I don't know, I don't know who, if he was the first, but somebody who busted my ass every time was, was Sam I Am, man. Sam Castell. Two point geezers. And, and, and we would always have our scouting reports and, and the way Utah worked, where Coach Sloan was, like whoever you had, like everybody had somebody that was assigned, right, for, for the scout. Right. So you would have to, before the game, basically go over the scouting report, tell them what, what, your, what their tendencies is. You had to memorize this stuff to yeah. speak back to everybody. And so the one thing that, that, that they had in there, like outline, was do not fall for his pump fake. Pump fake. Don't fall for his pump fake. You know what I'm saying? And uh, I don't know. I don't know if y'all play golf, but it's the same thing with golf. When you say don't hit it in the water, don't hit it in the water, don't hit it in the water. Yeah. Chances are you're gonna hit in the water. Yeah. Man, listen, I was in foul trouble every game I played Sam my rookie year. <laughs> and his pump fake, his back to the basket game just crazy killed me. Because I just wasn't used to that. I wasn't used to nobody backing me down. I'm like, no, you ain't finna back me down. I'm a big guard. Don't feel bad. Right hey, now, hey. I caught the same fade, same pump fake. I'm jumping. Right? Your coach looking at you about to scream on you and rip you out the game. Yeah, but then I started studying it and then started taking stuff from him. And so, you know, it definitely helped me. But yeah. I was like, that's the, the one who, the first one that really just gave me problems. Yeah, he. I tell people about him all the time. Like he one of the ones that don't get talked about. That yeah, like, kill your favorite point guards. He used to bust the ass. Not like he locking them up, but he was so effective on offense with that screen and roll, that pulling up at the free throw line, that pump fake, yeah. and all the stuff that. Fouls, yeah. He's be right. problems. Your favorite point guards. He's getting them problems. Yeah. Yeah. From Parkersburg. <laughs> West Virginia. I didn't even know this. And then they say you down there MMA and so you down there wrestling and stuff at first. So how was that growing up in Parksburg, West Virginia, and, you know, well, starting off wrestling? Yeah, so I, I only lived in Parker. I was born in Parksburg, lived in Williamstown, West Virginia, which was population like 2,000. Um, <laughs> so everybody I knew everybody. Everybody knew everybody. <laughs> uh, but my kind wasn't, wasn't, uh, wasn't common there, let's just say that. Right. <laughs> my con wasn't common there, and so we ended up moving. My dad was actually from Pittsburgh, and my mom my mom and him met playing basketball at West Liberty State. Um, and But I ended up moving, um, me and my mom ended up moving to, to Dallas uh, when I was four. And I don't know what, I think my, my uncle wrestled, you know, growing up, and he wrestled in, um, in the Army. And she came out, she said she came out one day and asked me if I wanted to wrestle. And I was like, all right, I'm four years old. I don't know no better. I was like, all right. So she signed me up and I went out there. My first match against a dude that like all his brothers wrestled. Like it's, that's their family's wrestling family. Right. Man, kid, man, put me on the ground so quick, pinned me. And I was crying. <laughs> and for the rest of that year, I cried every, she would have to drag me on the mat. She's one, she's one of the moms like, I pay for this. We right. got no need to be about to finish. And so you're going to finish. And she literally dragged me on the mat every match for the rest of the season. And, we, and I basically went out there and got my ass whooped <laughs> every match. All year. And then a whole year. And then the, the next summer, 
she she asked me again if I wanted to wrestle. She thought I was gonna say no right away, and she and I said yes. Mm. And it was a whole different story from that from that moment on. That some I don't know something clicked. Uh, but that's how I got into wrestling. Not a lot of people know that. But yeah, I wrestled for not the only reason I stopped wrestling is because of basketball. Once I got to high school, same season, so you can't do both. Was you crazy into WWE? Well, back then WWF. Yeah. WC- yeah. Like yeah, now that was, oh, see, that yeah. was generation. Yeah. it was real. Like, I don't watch it. I can't even watch it now. I think it's it's a joke. I hate it. I can't eat. I used to be prepared every Monday to watch wrestling. What? <laughs> man, like, oh, oh man, man. I used to like Royal yeah. Rumbles, all that stuff. I never missed the pay per view. And then once I got old, it was like, man, where did it go? Where did the love go? I got to send y'all, I was Macho Man a couple of Halloween's ago. I got to send y'all the costume, went all out for that one. Oh, okay, I definitely got to see that. So tell me this, like you said, you were in West Virginia where, you know, your kind isn't really accepted. How was it when you, you know, moved from, from West Virginia to Texas? How was that culture shock for you to be, you know, how, how much different was it? I mean, you know, I'm so, I was so young that I didn't really know. You know, you're four years old, you ain't really, you ain't even you're just a kid, you're not even thinking right. about that. So I didn't really know. It wasn't, so I, I actually would go back every summer uh, mm-hmm. with my grandparents. As soon as like, uh, as soon as school was over, um, they would drive up from West Virginia, pick me up and then and then drive me back. And I would stay the summer with them. And I did that every summer until uh, eighth grade. Mm-hmm. Cause you know, when you get eighth grade, you like, man, I wanna be around my friends. Like mm-hmm. I had friends, even though I had friends there, it wasn't the same. And it wasn't until them later years that I started realizing stuff that, that I didn't know before, you know, yeah. like, oh yeah, I am, I am different. Uh, people, right. treat me, people treat me different. People, you know, I had, a, it's crazy because my, my, my grandfather and my uncle were both racist. Mm-hmm. And then when I was born, my grandfather, he changed, but my uncle, he, he didn't, he was kind of, and I remember him saying little slick stuff to me when I was growing up, stuff that I didn't really understand until I started getting, getting older. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, that was the biggest thing, I think, once I, once I started realizing that, and that was like a reason why I didn't want to go back anymore for, for the longest time, mm. uh, because of, of, I started realizing how I was being treated. And so from a kid like in seventh, eighth grade, being that young, like how was that for you to see, like that was, that was in your own family, like that close to you, like not the, you know, people at school or the neighbors or something, this is yeah. like you say, your uncle and your grandfather. Yeah, yeah, I mean, um, It's it's tough. I mean, it's it's tough and it's tougher now to think about when you when you look back and you think about it. You know, yeah. you know what your relationships could have been like or what. My actually relationship with my grandfather was really was really uh, good until he passed. And then my uncle actually he he started turning the corner once I I think once he I think me being successful in basketball mm-hmm. and then he started watching and then he started liking like he was he was wearing like Luther head jerseys. So I knew yeah. he he changed you know the corner. Right. Um, but but at the same time, yeah, you know, it's it's uh, it's just frustrating to see that's how that's how society is, man. You know, and you see the climate of, of how things are right now. Absolutely. When did you start putting the ball in your hand? Like, who brought the ball to you since you was in wrestling? Like, who brought it to you? Like, my mom in? played. My mom played in college. Okay. Um, okay. she played in AIA. That's where my her and my dad met, and I didn't really grow up with my dad, but my mom, you know, uh. She was always into basketball. My, I had uh, cousins who played, you know, college basketball at some smaller schools. And so we were kind of a basketball family. And so, I, think, I mean, I got pictures of me on the little, you know, little hoop two years old. Right. You know, you know, you, you, so it was, you always had it was always, basketball was always my first love. You always had I played everything growing up. Any, you know, whatever the season was, I was going to do it. That's how, you know, I was just one of them kids. Whatever football season, I was football. Soccer, I wanted to be Pele, I, you know. The Mighty Ducks came out. I wanted to be a hockey player. I ain't never been on ice in my life, but I was ready to be a I was ready to be a Mighty Duck. So, um, but basketball was always the one. So when you got in high school, and uh, you know, like when was it when you felt like, all right, I'm the best player, and like this is my team, and, and, and college is going to get ready to start, like sending you letters. You know, for me, it was like, I think what made me so successful was that I wasn't one of them kids that, you know, I wasn't Darius Miles where I was like, he's going to be the one, you know, he's going straight to the league. 
this this kid right here is going to be special. I, and I was having a hard time, you know, finding AAU teams to play for, like, in seventh grade. You know, the, the best ones, they didn't really want me. Like, Team Texas, they put me on, like, their second, third team. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm being passed over for guys who didn't even end up playing basketball in high school. They wouldn't play football just because they were, you know, pure athletes. Right. Um, I always had a good understanding of the game. My mom was always big into, like, passing. You know, she she didn't want me to be – kid out here and I'm, I'm playing point guard so she didn't want me to be out there scoring you know 25 a night she, she would she would get pissed at me if I was wasn't sharing the ball yeah. and so I think that hurt me you know early on but also fueled me because I'm like getting passed over by these guys I think I'm better than and then I went to high school and I, I played with Bracey Wright I don't know if you remember him played at uh, Indiana Wolves for a little bit so he was McDonald's All-American kind of the one that everybody you know talked about yeah. Um, so it took me a little more time, you know, my like my junior year before, you know, people started recognizing me um, and, and, and getting recruited a little bit better. What could it be anybody else? Why Illinois? Why Illinois? Man. So. <laughs> so my 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 senior year, my top five was uh, going into my senior year was was Illinois, Georgia Tech, Tennessee. Uh, Mar- I think Maryland. I kind of had narrowed it down to four by then, and nine eleven happened mm-hmm. right before all the all my visits were were, were supposed to happen. So they, they all got postponed. So then I'm supposed to go to Tennessee, and a week before I go to Tennessee, C.J. Watson committed, mm-hmm. and then I'm supposed to go to Georgia Tech. The day I'm supposed to leave, Jared Jack committed. Wow. So then I'm sitting here. Illinois was always my number one, but they had D Brown already committed. And I'm like, why well, I'm gonna go to play with this little little dude? He's a point guard. Like, why like but he was recruiting me to harder. I couldn't understand it. He was recruiting me to harder. He D was the one that really got me to go to Illinois because I was like, why are they trying to get me? I'm a point guard. Why are they trying to get me? They must be giving me play the two. And he was like, No, he's the scorer. And D D convinced me. But um I was supposed to go to Maryland. And he told me, uh, like, Gary Williams ain't going to be there. So I'm like, yeah, I'm not going there. Really? And so, because <laughs> they had Steve Blake, too, at the time. Blake, so yeah. I would have went, went and sat behind him my, my, my freshman year. So kind of Illinois was, was it. And I had never been to the state of Illinois before I, could, I committed without going to the state. And, hey. and if I would have knew what the winners was like, I don't think I ever would have committed to Illinois. <laughs> <laughs> no weather at all. I didn't, I didn't know what I was getting myself into. Yeah, so tell me about that. How was it when you when you first get to, you know, you get the U of I, and now you're here and you're seeing, like, you know, you see the team and the squad, but how was that to be coming from Texas to, to, to Universe Champaign, Urbana, Illinois, and, you know, you're down there and you with the team. How was that change for you going into that culture? Well, so I graduated, like, the end of May, um, 17 years old. I don't turn 18 until June 26, and about – I leave – uh, on like the 5th of June to go to summer school. Mm. And about a week later, uh, my girlfriend and my, who's my wife now and my best friend called me and she was pregnant. Ooh. So I dropped that news on me <laughs> right. a, week, a week into my freshman year. Right. That changed, you know, changed a lot. It was like, Whoa, okay. Um, and then, you know, freshman year, I kind of got homesick you know, throughout the year, especially because of how cold it when when December hit, I was like, I'm not going outside. Yeah, like, I'm not, you know, <laughs> we got to walk everywhere too. I'm not going outside right now. <laughs> like, how y'all do this? This is not, this is not, like, people are not supposed to live here. It is. It is. <laughs> and, uh, it is. and then after my freshman year, um, Bill Self left to go to uh, Kansas. Kansas. And Billy Gillespie, who recruited me, had just left to go to UTEP to be a head coach uh, before the season started. So like the two coaches that got me to go there were leaving. I'm homesick. I just had a baby. <laughs> I was about to transfer. I was ready to go. I was ready to come home to Texas, even though I always said I wanted to get away from Texas. But all the guys, uh, you know, Jaren, Jaren Howard. Taps. Um, Taps, yeah. yeah. He, he, uh, he was the one, I think, that, that convinced me the most to stay and stick it out, and which I'm, I'm very glad I did because it's probably one of the best things that ever happened to me. How, right. how was that talking about Tap? Because I play AAU with Jaren, man. I just know how, man, just 
a, a great teammate, or just a great person. He always like he like the heart and soul of a team, whether he's playing or not. Hundred percent, heart and soul of a team. Like, how was that to to you know get down there and you you have Jerns, another point guard, like yeah. you said, like with D Brown, that's like encouraging. He's nearly not on the competition. Yeah type thing, he wanna, you know, help you transition, right? So how was that like for that to be like that? You know, it's funny, we talk we talk about it all the time. Like I was just talking to Jaren a couple of days ago and, and we was we was talking about, we always talking about practices and, you know, battling and going back and forth, the shit talk that we would do. Um, and it just says a lot about his character, like you said, like he is the heart, he was the heart and soul of our team. D was, but Jaren behind the scenes was as well. He kept everybody together, you know, he was he was already a coach before he was even a coach, yeah. and uh, I think that B and I's freshman year, because you know Frank left, Frank Williams had left, so in Jaren's mind, in Jaren's mind, he's thinking, all right, this this my time. I don't care what these how good these 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 young dudes is, and so he definitely pushed us that, that our freshman year. He thought he could challenge us. Definitely was mad. When we when we were start because we were both starting our freshman year, um, but at the same time, like he like I said, he pushed us every day in practice. Uh, he never you you never see any animosity out of him. Like I never felt any animosity, and he was I was ready to leave, and he was the reason I stayed. When when most people in that position would have pushed me out, you know what I'm saying? They would have been like, oh, this, is my, "This is my chance. Like I get him out of here. I'm uh, you know it's it's my it's my." my shot but um I don't understand how yet he didn't have a, a head coaching job yet because he's gonna make a, a hell of a head coach um because he just has that that's just his nature tell me how was it for you because because from the outside looking in I'm not really knowing who a Darren Williams is like you said I'm like the shot town boys about to go in yeah. and, 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 and turn up I'm expecting D Lou Luther uh obviously you know what I'm saying we know tap step so but from my lens, you came like out of nowhere. Like, who is this little light skin dude? This, this like he he like he the man though. Like, you know what I'm saying? It was like, cause you know, Chicago people, we gonna know who we know and we expect what we expect from them. And then it was like you just slid in the middle and was like, basically, I think did Lou lead y'all scoring, right? Luther? Or uh <laughs> somewhere, yeah, Lou did. Yeah, but it was still like. You was like the man though. You was controlling. And I was like, who is this one? This one like six four. He has he playing point and D Brown. I thought D Brown was gonna be the point. So it was like, like, how was that from your lens? With, with, did you feel that from the because you know Illinois is like that's that's kind of Chicago territory. Was it did you kind of feel that from everybody else's lens? Like you kind of came out of nowhere or I always, use, I always use that stuff for, for motivation. I remember after my freshman year, I led the team, I led the Big Ten in uh in assists and I had a pretty good you know, freshman season. Um, and then Rich McBride was coming in and I would get on the message boards and see what everybody's saying. And everybody's saying, I'm, you know, basically I'm not that great. Rich is going to come in. He's going to be the starter. He's the next one. And so I used all that stuff. I mean, nobody knew this at the time, but I, I used right. that stuff as motivation. And so, yeah, I mean, I, I did pay attention to that stuff. I, I read articles and I always use that stuff as motivation. Um, um, but at the same time, I thought what made us so successful is I didn't care who who got the shine. Like, yeah, we knew it was D's team. We knew D was the face face of of, of the team. And like you said, Luther led the, led the team in scoring. Um, but for us, it was just about winning. And I was happy for those guys, and they were happy for me. And uh, I mean, I think that's what made us so successful. Bruce Weber, like he got in your sophomore year. What clicked your sophomore year? that you like, what you learned from your freshman year that when Bruce came in, when Coach Bruce came in, it clicked your sophomore year to kind of like spread your wings a little bit more. Yeah, um, honestly, we, we didn't click at first. We were, we were struggling. Mm -hmm. We were struggling the, the first half of the season. We didn't, we didn't really like his offense. He was running the motion offense and it was just a struggle out there for everybody to grasp it and understand what he wanted. Um, and uh, it ended up being the best thing at the same time because once once we did learn that offense, you know, um, it, it was it was perfect for me. It was just playing basketball. It was just us out there playing basketball, out there hooping. It's like almost like you know going 
going to the rec with, with your boys and running the court. Have to that's make what, too many decisions. That's what it felt like. You know, we were just out there pick and roll. It was perfect, too, to set me up for the NBA game because it was a lot of pick and roll, a lot of movement. You know, yeah. I, learned, I learned to play off the ball um, a lot more than I think I would have under, under Coach Self. And uh, towards the end of the season, we ended up winning, I forget how many games on the road to, to win the Big Ten Championship, but we, we closed out. We called ourselves the Road Dogs because we didn't lose, like, I think it was like seven in a row on the road to, to, to win the Big Ten Championship. And then from there, you know, it kind of propelled us into that, that gym, my junior year when we, you know, started off 27-0. and 0. Uh, Yeah, y'all definitely, like, in history, uh, yeah, that, that backcourt that y'all got, like, in the run that y'all made, it's just, yeah. that was just crazy. What in that, that year when y'all made that run? So now, you know, I, obviously, I, like, I, we win, we win a lot of games, like, yeah. good. We 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 sh we should be able to compete with the Dukes in the North Carolina stuff. We got cheated and we got cheated in the tournament by Duke, <laughs> by the refs. We'll say the refs. <laughs> and lost well, it. Somehow Duke is always not always, but oftentimes on the on the on the uh went the pleasurable side of that. A hundred percent, hundred percent. What what part of that year did you feel that? I might be one of these ranked players. I might be one of these top players in college. To, to to compete with them. Cause you know, you know, they had them big time schools and you know, they had the players on there. So they'd be like them players, just instant yeah. lottery picks and all this stuff. Yeah. Which I mean, were undefeated in the in the Big Ten, you know what I'm saying? And y'all making the push. Y'all not nobody to just kind of look over no more. To start the season, um, I wasn't on any of the draft boards still. Yeah. You know, start start our junior year. And uh like you could just see it, like as the year went went on. You know, we beat when we beat uh, Wake Forest and CP, and then I think I was like second round. And then like as the year went on, and we kept winning. I just kept climbing and climbing and climbing. And then it really pushed me over the edge. I think was that that Arizona game, um, and then the, and then and then the Final Four. And then all of a sudden, I went from basically not really being on the draft boards to now I'm like top ten. Lottery pick. So I'm like I'm leaving. <laughs> In my mind, I'm like, yeah, I don't get no better than this. I never, I never, I always hoped, I always felt like I was good enough. Yeah. I always feel the same love from, you know, the outside, besides yeah. my mom and, and, you know, people close to me. Um, yeah. And then all of a sudden I'm, you know, top five. And so I'm like, yeah. Sometimes like when that journey be like, it's unbelievable. Like it's unbelievable that we making this run and everything is just like coming into place. It's like surreal. Like, right it, way. Yeah. That championship game. Like, you know, the championship game. I ain't rooted for Illinois since Kenny Anderson them, you know, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So the that, that championship game that y'all got down there, tell us about that game. Tell us how that game went through. Still haunts me. Um, you know, it was a it was a good game. I, I think the, the biggest thing that hurt us was was James Augustine getting in foul trouble. He got in foul trouble early. Sean May went like 13 for 13 from the field. Yeah. It's hard to <laughs> It's hard to stop that. Yeah. It's hard to stop that, you know, and then we, we had chances at the end, you know, we had a bunch of looks at, at threes to, you know, cut it to three, cut it to two, and just couldn't just couldn't get the ball in the hole. And that was a good team, man. They, they were a good team. I mean, they had, they had, I think, what, four, four or five guys in the first round, drafted yeah. in the first round. So the whole team it wasn't was like we was playing bums. We, <laughs> we was playing a stack NBA ball. Yeah, definitely yeah. Were. yeah. So I hey, tell me how was it for you? Cause like that's that's crazy to hear you say that, you know, going to your into that year, you weren't even on draft boards. How how did how like tell me how that went like complete 180 from probably no calls, no, you know, from the pros or none of that attention to you being like after that a top five pick, it had to be interviews, magazines, people, agents trying to get at you. Like at what point in the season did that all intensify to where it was like, okay. Cause we all had it happen for, you know, at one yeah. point maybe it was like, for me, I remember we played Maryland with Steve Francis and all in the BBNT classic. I had 29 or whatever. And after that USA Today was like, he gone, you know what I'm saying? So and for me, it was like in that moment in the season, I was like, yeah. Like I could, I could get up out of here if I want to. So like, what point for you did that happen? Cause you saying you came into the joint, not even in the, you know, on the draft boards in the first round under that, then you end up top five, third pick. Like how, at what point did it, at some point it exploded, <laughs> it had to. 
Yeah, I mean, it was definitely that that last year. I mean, we I mean, we're number one since like the third game of the season. And like I said, I just kept climbing up those boards and you could see it. And then, you know, I was getting calls, you know, from people I didn't even know, uh, you know, had 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 several, you know, runners or whatever contacting me. But my mom, yeah. she don't play. She don't play that. All right. No, she don't play that. So I wouldn't I wouldn't entertain them. I just said, I, you know, I'll worry about that after the season. Um, and, you know, definitely the, the, the media grew. Um, <laughs> around us it was it, it just it, I feel like it happened so fast that I really didn't have a chance to really reflect until till it was done you know it was it it, it wasn't like a a constant a gradual build it was kind of like boom 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 oh this is just happening like it's just this all just happened because I'm just out there we're just out there trying to win games and before you know it we're you know 10 and 0 13 and 0 20 and 0 you know and, and it, was, it just it just happened that way. You could you couldn't draw you couldn't draw it up better, <laughs> except for winning that last one against Carolina. Tell me about once you declared for the you know okay now all right I'm out of here I'm going like what was that experience like following your decision to announce that you coming out you got to pick an agent got to do all that how did that process go for you? Yeah, so I mean in my mind. <laughs> I was already like, I knew I was going to leave um, before the season was over. Uh, just because, like I said, cause I, I'd already climbed top 10. I'm like, I mean, yeah. I don't, you got to go while it's hot, right? Yeah. Uh, but after the season, you know, I talked to Coach Weber. He's like, all right, well, let me, let me talk to some people and, and, and make sure, find out, you know, what, what, you know, what really, yeah. what really is going to happen. And so, he came back like a week later. He's like, yeah, you're going to be top five. So I think you should leave. <laughs> I think yeah, you should leave yeah. too. And, uh, you know, like I said, I had a baby. You know, she was almost two at the time. Uh, my mom didn't have a job. She was, she had been, she had been unemployed for like seven, eight months. So for me, it was, it was the right, everything. Yeah. It was the right time for everything. So, um, you know, single mom raising two kids. You know, it was it was time for me to go, um, and I moved. I uh, my 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 high school coach actually worked for um, a guy named Bob McLaren, who was uh, his uncle was owns the Astros, oh. and uh, he wasn't even in the he wasn't even in the in the Asian game, um, but he was really smart, really sharp dude. He was president of Astros for for several years, so he knew that you know he knew the insides of, of of the business and uh, ended up being my agent. And uh, I just wanted somebody I could trust because I felt like there was just so much, so much going on with these with these agents that I didn't that I didn't like. And I just felt like everybody had an agenda and I didn't want to be a part of that. So um, I actually went with them and, and moved down to Houston to, to train, um, uh, to get ready for the draft. Finally got me, you know, I was a little, little, little pudgy in college, so. I ain't want to say it earlier when I said you came out of nowhere. I was like, who's this little light skin? Look, I ain't want to say, you know, I was going to be nice and say a little doughy or something. I ain't want yeah. to. Yeah. No, it is what it is. I was, man. I was, man, late nights, I was, everybody else was eating cheeseburgers and, and fries. It just hit me a little different. We ain't got <laughs> the same, we don't got the same genetics. <laughs> Get up on you and start sticking to man, you. <laughs> man, I play with guys, I play with guys in the NBA. They, they're eating, uh, Chicken tenders and fries before the game, going out and getting 25. I'm, if I do that, I'm gonna gain 25 before the game. That was us. Yeah. <laughs> Gerald Wallace. Yeah, Gerald Wallace. <laughs> hey man, never put nothing green in his body. <laughs> no, but uh so I moved down to Houston. I finally got my nutrition right, hired a hired a trainer and and started getting ready for the draft. I mean, um, workouts slash just interviews that you going because you wasn't doing too many workouts. You wasn't going against nobody. You was just getting wind and dying and talk to they was trying to pick your brain, right? So I went see here. That's the UND Miles treatment. That's the you know the phenom the phenom treatment. Milwaukee had the first pick. I didn't I didn't work out for them because everybody knew they were taking Andrew Bogan. Yeah. That was kind of set in stone. So I worked out for Atlanta. 
I worked out for Utah, Charlotte, and Orlando had like the 11th pick. They were talking about trading up. And I, I, I was like, I don't, I was like, I told them I wasn't going to do it, but then my agent was like, no, they're going to they're gonna try to trade up, so they want you to work out. But my whole thing going in, because Chris Paul was still ahead of me on most of the, the drafts, so my whole thing was, look, I'll work out with anybody you want as long as Chris Paul's there. That was it. I said, I'll work out whoever you want, just make sure Chris Paul's there. And so Orlando actually tricked me. They said that he was going to be there. Or no, they said it was just going to be me, and then I get there, and it was Ray Felton. Ray Phillips was in the workout. So I called my agent. I'm like, look, I'm like, I'm not trying to duck anybody. I'm not scared of anybody. I'll work out with it. But this, you said, like, I, this is what we said. But he's like, you know what? Just go ahead and do it. So I went and worked out for them too. Uh, but those are those the four, four workouts I did. Sound about right. You and D-Miles sitting in a little cozy, you know, cozy chairs out there. Where, How where do you do? Players got to go take like 18, 19 workouts. <laughs> all the you country. ain't had no 18 workouts. Bro, I did like 16. I, I don't remember. It was a high team number. For real? Teens. Well, you know, D-Miles, like some people, I, man, I worked out for Boston like three times, bro. They tried to give me a workout the night before the draft. Man, my agent was like, nah, hell nah. Jeff was like, hey, you didn't sat down, had dinner with him. I, I met with Boston, bro. This when they had, uh, they had Jim O'Brien. Um, was it Jim O'Brien or John? It was the O'Brien. He was the head coach. And they had, uh, was, huh? Yeah, Paul and Twan and all that. Yeah, Paul, yeah, they was there. Yeah, I'm talking about the I'm talking about the you know the front office and all that. But like, yeah, they had me come in like three times, bro. Cause I think they had, I don't remember what pick they had, but they wound up taking like Jerome Moise or something that year. They did take Moise. I got picked 18, bro. I was I was I they did me dirty. I <laughs> one year too long. I should have left after my freshman year. You know, that's another story for another day. <laughs> you when you heard Utah, I don't know too many people gonna want to go to Utah. When you heard Utah was the place that you was going to. Yeah. How did you feel? Was you cool with it? Or? Yeah, I was, I was cool with it. I feel like I'm, I'm, I can adapt. I can live anywhere. Yeah. Um, was, like, I, I was born in Parkersburg, West Virginia, so yeah. Let me rephrase that question. It wasn't just Utah. It was like you going to Utah and you finna go and play for Jerry Sloan. Yeah. Yeah, like you thought you had hard coaches in the past, or somebody that messed with you in the past. Nah, it was yeah. Nothing like that, Jerry Sloan. So you know, you know think I, of I actually, all that. How was that? When I when I when I looked at it, when I broke down all the teams that were, you know, those top, really two through five or six, whatever it was, that was the team I wanted to go to the most mm, okay. because I felt like I had the chance to win the most there because I felt like they had a, a, a good team who had injuries the year before, and that's the only reason they they fell that far. Okay. They had Booze, they had Memo, they had AK. Yeah. But Booze missed like a bunch of games that year. And so I felt like if I went there, we had a chance to win, and we had a Hall of Fame coach. Um, you know, I didn't know anything about, you know, in depth about Jerry Sloan. Yeah. You know, I just knew he was a good, a good coach. His, his system, like I hate his system. Like I hate the cross every time. We hate, hate guarding his system. That's you damn right. We hate guarding yeah. his system. Yeah. Yeah. No other experiences. Like, like wait, what? Face them wings and watch I had Paul Silas. be tired like nah. Yeah. So when I had Paul Silas, that was the first time I had to play in his system. The high post where, the, where uh -huh. your your big man's got to start off on the on the wing of the free throw line and all that yeah. stuff. He played me at point guard. So I was like, man, every time I got to slow down, wait till everybody get in their position, kick it to the side, then cut off the big man. And just to get the big man the ball on the post, I got to come up and screen for him. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, I used to run it so perfectly, but when I did, it was like, man, you slowing me down. Do you know how much dummy offense we did? Hey. Oh, yeah, I had to. Man, I, so we would do it. Some days we'll come in and he'll put me at the five and he'll put booze at the one. Yeah. You had to know every... He wanted you to know every position so that it was just everything was interchangeable. And that's how how good we run it. But that's what made it that's what made it so successful is because of how hard we ran it and how well we ran it. I think what you just said is like one of the things that people don't understand about. It's like one of the main instruments of greatness. Like you just said, like, you know, Jerry Sloan, Hall of Fame coach, one of the best coaches ever. But what you just said struck a nerve when you said. Y'all don't realize how much dummy offense we ran. 
that is where the greatness lies. Yeah. Why you say that he's rep just completely repetition, repetition, then, oh, okay, y'all got it. Now you play the five, you play the one, you play the four, and then repetition, repetition, like yeah. that right there. And then you can go out there, the result is, is what me and D saying, we hate playing against y'all. Y'all can run that shit with y'all eyes closed behind y'all back where he there, when he not there, it's like y'all can coach ourselves with it because he didn't drill it into your head so many times that it's like, it's like your muscle memory now. It's a quick twitch skill, you just do it. Yeah, I mean, shit, we had, we used to tape for, we used to tape for shoot arounds. Oh yeah, I know about that action. And, and, went, and went live. I don't know, I could, I don't know if I could have been, you know, 20, 29, 30, 31 doing all that. That was when it came to me, 29, 30. I got to Miami in 29, left Miami, was in Orlando. I'm talking about, I'm talking about, bruh, never in my whole career, never wore knee braces, knee pads, none of that. I'm talking about first day of training camp, First day, you go in there, they got two sets of knee pads on your on your locker. I'll come in like, you know, I'm going on my 10th year. I'm like, oh no, I'm cool with this. I give them back like, I don't wear these. They hand them right back to me. No, you ain't got to wear both, just pick one pair. I'm like, I don't use knee pads. They're like, you do now. They're like, you ain't got to wear them in the game, but everybody in practice, you got to because Pat Riley had a thing where, you know, how they play and teach and teach defense. It ain't no, you know, you getting over screens, you getting up. They guys kept, bumping knees with the technique he was saying. So he made everybody from, everybody, one through 15, whole team gotta wear knee pads. And this, I'm talking about this side, it became like that for like, how you say you gotta be taped for shooting around. You come in someday, but you gotta get taped and them knee pads sitting there, you like, oh. Man, we, <laughs> you like, that's the we, doing charge, we was doing charge drills in February. <laughs> we just start, we want to be on opposite sides of the, of the, of the floor. Now that's the crazy. Half court mark, and we had to <laughs> beat him to the spot and take the charge. <laughs> I'm taking charges on booze in February. <laughs> <laughs> Bruised tailbone. Like <laughs> nah, that's, that's that's crazy. When was it? When was it that the offense clicked for you? When was it that you seen you seen Coach Sloan and like you knew what he wanted? Because like when you click, you ain't just like just slowly get into it. You clicked and just start killing everybody. Who were you backing up originally? To start the season, uh, Keith McLeod was starting at point guard. And then Milt Palacio. Milt. Milt. Okay. Both, both of them got hurt. I'm the only other, there's, there's me. I gotta start. He started Andre Owens. Hey, yo. He started Hey, yo. Who ain't no point guard. You know A.O. ain't no damn point A.O. guard. A.O. is a scoring guard. Come on. Straight scorer. Yeah. But Sloan, it's like the first half of the season. Are you trying to humble you? Are you that, trying to it, it was like, but he just wants some, uh, he's just, he's that old school coach where he's just not going to give something to yeah. somebody. Even, even if I probably should have had it from the start. Mm -hmm. Right. And so now I went, I, I went through about five phases there in my, my rookie year where I was just like, I didn't know what to do. I was about to lose my mind. But so to start out the, the season, I was playing, I was playing second quarter and fourth quarters. That's it. <laughs> That's it. I was so I was finishing games. I was finishing games. Nowadays, no nothing about these OG coaches that we came in with, boy. Like the we, I mean, all the all the rookie stuff. They don't do none of that stuff now. They don't even allow it. We had to unpack the book. I remember we they don't even allow it. They tell the people before they start doing, hey, hey, no, we're not gonna do that. And they because they don't want anything to happen. They don't want to be on social media and all of it. They don't want to have to deal with a situation and they making it so weak with that. Cause I, I've seen it in person where they tell them, nah, don't mess with them and do all of that stuff. I'm like, what? Man, we had, I remember the first we we went to Boise, Idaho for training camp. We get off the uh we get off the we yeah, exactly. We get off the <laughs> We get off the, we get off no the bus. No disrespect, Boise, I know. No disrespect to anybody yeah. from Boise. I'm just saying. A lot of people there. going to like Hawaii or Navy bases or Army academies and like some, you know, like I ain't never heard nobody say they went to Boise. That's just me. And we got off that bus and it's cold. It was a little chilly. And they like, uh, all right, rookies, y'all got to go help with the bags. So we out there unloading the, the, the plane and putting it on the bus. I'm like, what? What is this? This is not the NBA. This ain't the NBA. Then we get to the, we get to the, 
the hotel and they're like, all right, um, we got we got our first practice at, at uh, we're leaving at 9 a.m. Y'all need to come down here at eight and get all the bags. The, That's that gear the out. Big, the big <laughs> heavy bag. The bag weighs like a hundred pounds with all the gear in it. <laughs> but we gotta go just drag that around all up and down the hallways, drop putting the putting the loops on each everybody's door. Yeah, me and D Miles did that. Me, D Miles, and Keon. It was just three of us instead of just one. We had three of us together. We did that. We dropped the gear off at the door. Man, you we didn't do that shit. You no, we did bagels and donuts. Stop, gear off. Off. That shit. Stop lying. We didn't do that. Y'all ain't doing none of that? Hell Bro. no. We didn't do that shit. Bro. We didn't do that shit. You never wanted to do it. We did do that. He, do that. he made us he made us do one thing. After that shit, we, we did Palm that Springs, thing. bro. We did that in Palm Springs. The one thing. We I did this the whole year. They grabbed the jersey off that one day. No, and we, no, 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 no. We never did that shit the whole year. Now we did that's what I'm telling you. We did that in training camp. That wasn't a whole year type activity for us, but like we definitely did that in training camp, bro. And it was three it of us. It was, it was easy because it was three of us. Like we we was done with it, but you know, ain't but 12, 13, 14 players, like three of us, we did that thing fast. Now we ain't had to carry no heavy ass bag. We just split it up right there and bam, bam, bam. Yeah, they ain't had to do that shit. I had to do it the whole year. <laughs> Wait up. Like with Sloan, he was, was he strict, strict? Yeah, we had a lot of rules, man. We had a lot of rules, man. I just, it's crazy. I was just cleaning out something. Oh, a storage unit. That I had, man. I ain't I didn't realize I had this storage unit. <laughs> they had called me like you got a storage unit. <laughs> like you got a storage unit. I'm like, what? <laughs> I went and cleaned it. That was just a whole bunch of old stuff. My grandma's stuff, my mom's stuff mainly. But I found one of the jazz hand uh, like handbooks. <laughs> <laughs> you start every training camp, we would go, we have our team meeting. Coach Sloan would be he would, I, I remember this like yesterday, man. He would flip through this book. And he would have his glasses on, he would be reading, and he'd take them up his off. And he would be mad about like it's like we did something wrong, but it's the first the first meet never. When he's going over the rules, like he already mad because he knows somebody gonna break the rule. <laughs> you know, we gotta tuck, you gotta tuck your shirt and your strings in your pants at all times for practice game, whenever you're on the court, he'll send you back if you don't have them tucked in. We had a no cell phone rule on the bus. Ooh, so bus. On the bus, couldn't be on a cell phone. So like, yeah, <laughs> you want to make a phone call, you had to step off the bus, call, even when somebody was late for a shoot around, like we on the bus waiting for somebody. We couldn't call them on the bus. We had to get off the bus. Call them. Hey man, where you at? <laughs> wow. Get on the bus. That's not not like, like, bro, it's so, like people, they be in a locker room. I'm talking about, bro, I just sat in there when I worked for the Pistons, I'm sitting there watching, you know, I, you know, when you come in at halftime or whatever, Coach is going there to do that little power while I'm just sitting there, chilling, just looking around. Whole thing, that's how they come in. They come in like this. Oh yeah, they on the on the social media. Oh, yeah, the coach coming at you like. <laughs> like yo. Yeah, they on, yo. <laughs> See, that's the one thing we didn't really have. That was before social media. Like it was just Facebook around yeah. that time, and it wasn't even on your phone. So, <laughs> so it wasn't. I mean. It wasn't a lot you could do besides text on the on the phone back nice. then. But oh, still, oh, Coach Sloan wouldn't have none of that. That's what I'm saying. That's gangster to hear that he wouldn't even like on a bus, bro. Like that's like, come on, man. Sometimes it'd be like a 40 minute boat bus ride from the yeah. airport to the hotel. You can't even call and talk to your wife. Say, hey, we landed. We good? <laughs> like, no, you can't talk to your kids. None of that. <laughs> none of that. When did it click for you? When his offense clicked and you was like, he was your guy. When you felt he was your guy. Probably after my freshman year, after my rookie, I see freshman year, after my rookie year, my sophomore year. Um, Cause like I said, that that first year was so much, so much ups and downs and like him, you know, kind of messing with me, playing me, you know, I finally think I'm about to start. Yeah. I'll start. Uh, then, he, then I had a little stretch where I, I, I kind of got, yeah, I kind of got like a little pissy attitude because I felt like he was treating me unfairly. And it was, I think that was him just trying to see how I respond. And so it was right before uh, um, All-Star break. And, you know, I was just kind of, uh, he, he had like barely played me in a couple games, like eight, 12, you know, 20 minutes here and there, just was very sporadic. And so I, I went away for, I went to, you know, rookie game and 
I came back and I said, you know what? I don't care if he plays me at the one, he plays me at the two. I don't care what he did. I'm just going to play hard as shit. I'm just going to play hard. And I think that's kind of where it started to click. Because then shortly after that, then he started me for the rest of the season, like the last, you know, 30 games of the season. And, and I think it started to click a little bit there. But then that, that next year, I came back. He had me go to uh, Summer League. And I was thinking I was going to do Summer League. And, like, after, like, I think two games, he they just – they just pulled me out. They're like, I guess we've seen enough. You're good. And so, because like I said, his his offense is so unique. Like y'all y'all the only team that was really kind of running that yeah. that style of offense with the with the guys. High. Some teams had it, but that was just like a package and they whole little thing. But what in his offense that you seen that like, oh, I can. I could succeed in this. Like I used to hate when you used to kick it to the wing and then you you all gay, you've been coming off the screen on a high post slow and then in the fourth quarter, you want to go off extra fast and get you a bunny. I used to hate that shit. So like, like what in the offense that you seen that was like, man, I can work with this or I can work with that? Well, I think one was how effectively we, we knew how to run it as a team. But then also I felt like for me, you know, I was never the, the the like the most explosive, the fastest guy, but I did have a good change of pace, change of direction. Mm-hmm. My IQ was really really good, and so I, I like you said those those easy ones. I knew how to get those little easy ones. Um, you know, if I felt somebody like they were trying to cheat the screen because they know I'm coming off the screen, then I'll just bump back for the layup. Mm-hmm. Or or if like when I when I go off and I know they're, you know they're trailing too far. I'll just bump out to the corner and just get a three right there. It was just so many different ways you could break off, even though it was this set plays, you know, that you could break off. And then I had Booz who, who was, was really smart at slipping, slipping uh, screens. I would come off the screen and he was already slipping. I just did a little touch pass to him. And we had Memo who was (laughs) Memo. If Memo was playing in today's NBA, Man, he'll be max every year, max and then max and then max again. I like Memo. Memo was solid. <laughs> hey, yeah, gay, man. Memo had gay. He could, he could shoot the three. You know, he was like a a, a dirt, a light dirt. You know what I mean? Yeah, I felt like it was perfect. The scenario that you went into, like especially once everything kind of like uh, got ironed out and y'all was all hitting on the same so because it was like seeing. Uh, a different variation of what he did with Malone and, and, and Stockton. Like, you know what I'm saying? With you and Bulls, like uh, playing a one and, and a big man at the four, it was a different variation, but you could see his same impact being put on, on y'all and y'all flourishing under it. Like, did, did y'all get any of those comparisons with y'all? I mean, he had to, obviously. Yeah, of course, it. of course, you know. I mean, but it's hard to be compared to, two, you know, them two. <laughs> two of the great ever do it man uh and and their longevity man i mean john barely missed john barely missed games i i, I honestly I, I mean they just had to be the toughest dudes in the in the world <laughs> i mean i am you know they played as many games without missing like I, I i saw some stats not too long ago on social media about stockton and, and malone like how many games them dudes played and didn't miss games it was like unbelievable yeah, and, and see how physical they play with that. Exactly, and that, and and in the '90s, I mean, that's a where well, they trying to take your head off, and they ain't, they ain't calling. They know there's no uh, there's no flagrant twos for accidentally hitting somebody in the head. Mm-hmm. Uh, Did you uh, have the uh, opportunity to get a chance to like you know, it's, it's, you kind of figuring out the offense. You had the opportunity to to kind of pick John Stockton brain and and have conversations with him about. Like your offense and stuff so my, like that. Before my rookie season, they sent me up there. They sent me up to Spokane, and I spent uh, I spent like five days with them. Oh, um, all right. Working out. That's it was, it was right amazing. There. You know, what kind of regret. My biggest regret was not reaching back out to them after. You know, like and doing it again. It should have should have been something that I probably did like Once every you- time. Because he like John's not like. You, you could tell he's one of those guys who he's not, he's not big into the spotlight. He's not big into the limelight. He just, you know, he's happy in his, his life up there. So he's not a guy who's just going to reach out. You know, I think they reached out to him and was like, Hey, we want, we got this new guy. We want to send him up there. And so, um, but man, I learned a lot, honestly, just in that, in that, those five days, you know, we, we talked about pick and roll scenarios, you know, talked about, you know, basically what to expect from, from coach. Um, when we, he put, you know, put me through several workouts that he used, used to do. And, um, 
you know, different little shooting drills uh, where he would, you know, shoot off of the wrong foot. And just little, little things that, that, that really helped me a lot, I think, um, throughout the course of my career. Um, and it was just, I mean, when you get a chance to learn from a guy like that, it's just amazing. And I want you to speak on um, too is uh, Carlos Boozer. He played with you. A lot of people, like I love Booz. I remember when he was in Cleveland. I used to be like, man, you get you 10 and 10, that's like a hundred million dollars right there. That's all you need is 10 points, 10 rebounds. But he was so big and people don't understand how talented he was. He used to use his left, he was right handed, but he used to use his left hand and he wouldn't be able to finish under the basket if he didn't dunk it or lay it with his left. If he did it with his right, it was like he missed it. And it was like, bro, you right-handed. I never but how good uh, was Boozer that people don't really give him the proper props? Because they'd be like, oh, he stole this money. And I'd be like, nah, Boozer came from a lot to get to where he was at. Yeah, Boozer averaged 20 and 10, like 20 plus and 10, like three, 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 four years in a row. Uh, Double double game. Yeah, I mean, uh, no, nah, he had game, man. He was fun to play with in that pick and roll. He had a great feel for the game, like you said. Anybody who comes from, from Duke, they're going to have a good feel for the game. They're going to know how to play the game of basketball. Um, Don't give Duke that much pride. Don't give Duke that much pride. I mean, <laughs> I, do like, I do like Coach K. It's straight you know, I, up. <laughs> I did play for him, you know, to Olympics. So, yeah. although I don't like Duke, <laughs> I like Coach K. Love Coach K. <laughs> Love Coach K. Um, but now Booz was fun to play with. Like you said, he's such a good, good teammate, good dude. He's one of the people just always positive, always smiling, dap you up about 20 times. Like, damn, Booz, and you just dap me up? What's up, Willie? Booz Clue, that's my guy. 06, 07, man. Y'all boys played y'all ass off. I remember watching y'all in the, in the playoffs and y'all going the distance with the Spurs. And to me, like, that was when it was like, okay, you put on a show, that whole playoffs. And like, even I, I can remember even after that series and y'all losing, the Spurs players making it a point to give you your due credit. Like, yo, that's a bad boy. Like, you know what I'm saying? How did, how did that feel? For, I mean, albeit in defeat, but to see some of the greats, Tim Duncan, Tony Parker, your peers, you know what I'm saying? They would go on to be, I think Very they won that year. Oh, they won, they swept, they swept uh, Braun and them. In the right, right, that's the year they won. So like, y'all lose to the eventual champions and you get the kudos from those guys that you got. How did that that year as an overall, like, cause that was a, a big year for you. Yeah, that was my you second year. And I feel like that's, you know, you talk about those moments where like the light comes on or whatever. I think, I think that was when my confidence meter hit you know, a high, you know, like, I think that's what, where I was like, man, I can, I can, I can really be somebody, you know, because like you said, I mean, that was the Spurs. They were, they were a good team. I mean, they beat us, I think, 4-1, but again, some real questionable calls uh, <laughs> could have been a little different, different uh, series, but, you know, I, I had, I think Bruce Bowen guarded me a lot that, that series. And I averaged like 20, like 25 for the mm -hmm. series. And, uh, you know, it just gave me a lot of confidence, I think, going into that next year and, and you know, the years to follow because, you know, if I could do that against them in the playoffs in the Western Conference Finals, you know, I, I should be able to do this anytime I want. This is what I want to know, because it was like, I can't remember the exact years, but it was a, a good three to four year stretch where you and Chris Paul, had it might have been longer than that, but I know it was a stretch where y'all had the whole league. Who the best point guard between y'all two? And I know you guys are cool and everything. I'm not, you know, yeah. saying I'm pitch you. You know, I know y'all golf and everything. I'm talking about, but for y'all, for you in that time, that was your that was your window as like the elite. You 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 one A or one B is like best point guard in the league. That's how, you know what I'm saying, your peers. Like, I, I'm in the league at this point playing and I'm in what's supposed to be my prime and all that. And I'm agreeing. I'm like, me and my partners, we talking about it. You know how it is, basketball dudes, we talking about it. Like, how was that for you to come from where you come from? You know what I'm saying? Not not always the 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 overhyped or the, the the spotlight guy. You was You was chubby when you first got here. You know what I'm saying? And now, to be mentioned and, you know, argued or debated, like, am I the best point guard? Like, how did that, how was that for an accomplishment for you? Did you feel like I've arrived, I'm here now, like, they they see me? 
Yeah. I mean, it's something that I always, like I said, when I talked about, you know, looking at those message boards in, in, in college, well, I did the same thing when I got to the NBA. I was, I was on real GM and all, all that stuff. Just, looking, <laughs> just always looking at stuff. Man. I always use that as fuel. And uh, so like, yeah, I mean, me, me and CP were good friends. You know, we would have dinner to, to, when they came in town, when I came in town, but when we stepped on that court, you know, all that was out the window. And uh, definitely enjoyed, you know, playing against him because he put, he always pushed me. He was a good competitor. Um, and, uh, but as far as like, how did it feel? I mean, it felt good, but at the same time, it's kind of what I expected out of myself. Like I expected, you know, to be one of the best. I always thought I was one of the best, even when I wasn't, you know, even back going back to high school, you know, going to ABCD camp. I always felt like I could compete with these guys. I was always, you know, on par better than them. Just people hadn't seen it yet. And so uh, I think that was kind of something that drove me too when I got to the NBA is like, I'm always being overlooked. I'm always being overlooked. One of the things I used to like watching you when you played was like, you used to do the double crossover. And like, it's like every time I do the double crossover, they never go for the second one because I done crossed them and they just still sitting over there. But when I used to watch you, I used to wonder like, man, how is he getting the double crossover off on these folks and you hitting them twice and they going for it twice. When did you add that to your game and where did you get that from? Man, I think it's just one of those things that just kind of evolved. Um, and I, 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 like I said, you know, I talked about, you know, picking things off from Sam Cassell. I picked up a lot of stuff from other, you know, you know, I picked up crossover from AI, but then they started calling carry on that crossover. So then you had to adapt. Everybody had, I, had the one, I had the one that Steph had. Remember when he used to pick it up high and then go and then like go over, throw it over? Yes, yeah, I already <laughs> do that one too. And then Jay Kidd had to, he didn't have a crossover really in half court, but he had that one going full speed. Full court. Boom, boom. And like I, I used to study all like all this stuff. And and in, and, and in, high, in uh, college, we used to play cutthroat a lot. That was like our game. I mean, we'd be, we'd be sitting there playing space. It's you know eleven o'clock at night, about to go, we're about dressed and ready, about to go out to the bars. Somebody's talking shit. I'll bust your ass. <laughs> Here we All go, right. and we'll go up to the gym. So we just play one on ones, you know, cutthroat and playing cutthroat, especially with like two three dribbles. You would learn, you would learn how to get your shot off, how to create space, how to how to make these moves with only two, three dribbles. And so one of those was that double cross. It somehow it just, it, it took effect. You know, it was not something I like really thought about before I did it. It just kind of, just kind of oh. became. Cause it looks smooth. It's, it's so on rhythm for you to cross the ball over twice. You definitely got to have a rhythm. Yeah. To you to not be off balance. You double crossing and you will come up for a pull up or you will double cross and go to the rack. And I was like, how the fuck do we get that? Like. I can't get it for shit. Like, don't go for it. You seven, you a seven foot. You're a seven footer. You ain't supposed to be doing all that. Yeah, you gotta try though. You gotta take this shit. From me. Bro, he was a unicorn for that. Yeah. Week, all that. You know what I'm saying? He was out there long. <laughs> long do, you, long do you remember this? You remember we played in Portland, right? We was playing against y'all, and y'all used to kick our ass all the time. We was playing in Portland. And it was the end of the game. You came off a screen and roll, but you ain't come all the way off. And I just dove for the ball and stole it. It went down and dunked it. And you told the ref, you like, man, he fouled me. <laughs> you remember that? Uh-uh. Yeah, it was the end of the game. We played. Did y'all win the game? Yeah, we won that game. We won it because of that layup. You got to go back and see that, man. Poor. You got to go back and see that. Yeah, I forget that shit, too. I don't remember somebody stripping me and getting Yeah, the uh, yeah. You that's, remember that's, not, that's not a thing. Now, if you would have told me. I crossed you twice and then hit the hit the game winner. I would remember that. How did it feel to like when you made your first All Star team? I felt like it was a long time coming. I felt like I should have made one, maybe two more before that. Yeah, yeah, but like you know, you know, like back then, you know, you kind of had to wait your dues. It wasn't like these young cats that kind of come in and and get the recognition early. It's exactly what happened. I mean, I was even told that the reason I didn't make it. Yeah, it wasn't yeah. my it wasn't my time yet. Young uh, fellas, we got a lot more years. We got to make sure, you know what I'm saying? In the NBA, to get the all-star, to be named the all-star. How was that for you? That was, it, was, it was awesome. It was awesome because it was in Dallas that year, too. So, mm -hmm. you know, I was going home. 
all my family was there. They could come, come, come to the game. And, um, you know, it definitely meant a lot. Like, like you said, I mean, it was, that's, that's stuff when you're a kid, like, uh, they showed a yearbook when we were playing San Antonio because I lived in San Antonio for two years and um, it asked what I wanted to be when I, when I, when I grew up and it's, it was NBA All-Star. Mm. So, you know, I finally, that was, what, fifth grade, I think. I finally realized my, you know, my dream, my goal uh, and, was, and was there. That's crazy. Tell me about the, the, the 2011, right? We sitting there in the lockout. How did you end up getting a $5 million dollar contract to play in Turkey. Like you, you like you know what I'm saying? A lot of dudes was going, we we all know that dudes was going to China, dudes was going here, there. But I ain't I don't, I don't recall nobody going nowhere for no five milli for the one year. How did that come about? It wasn't quite five mil, but it was it was a good change. It was a good change. You know I, 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 I had money. <laughs> so um I was you know, we had we had all those meetings that year before where they was talking about the lockout. You know, they was they was telling us to prepare for the lockout. You know, they're telling everybody to save their money. You know, this and this. It's it's probably prepare for it to last the whole season. Right. So in my mind, I'm thinking we're just too far apart. This going and I had been to the meetings. You know, I had been to the meetings and had heard the owners and how they greasy they was talking to us. <laughs> and so I'm like, this is gonna last a year. It's not. We not. And I'm like, I don't want to be out of basketball for a year. Right. So I had uh, at the I switched agents to to Excel, and so Jeff Schwartz um, was my agent at the time, and I basically told him like, "Hey, if you come across anything interesting, you know, let me know." Right. And uh, soon after, he came back and said this team in in, in Istanbul, Turkey, um, was interested, and then I I, I hit up Memo Memo Okur, talked to him about you know he'd always been high on Turkey anyways and, and, and telling me about it and I'd been wanting to visit. So I ended up going over there and playing. Um and it took took the whole family over there. And honestly it was a it was a, a once in a lifetime experience and it's something I'm I'm glad I did uh because uh I made a lot of friends over there, you know, guys I still talk to. Um got a chance to play basketball in, in a different setting, you know, in, in a different league and and then experience the, the Turkish culture and, and experience their food and, and and everything over there. And it was amazing. When you got traded from Utah, was it was just time for, for a new setting? Yeah. Um, I mean, I think the, the the stuff that transpired with Coach Sloan when he when he resigned, um, that and like I had already, I think I had already come to them and kind of led them to believe that I was gonna leave. Yeah. Um, and so I think that's why they, 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 they went ahead and traded me so they could get, get something back from me. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, looking back on it, you know, it's one of the things where you like, you don't appreciate stuff until, until it's gone. It's gone. Yeah. Or somewhere. So, you know, I had never really lost in my career. I mean, in, in high school, I lost eight games, college, my whole college career, I lost 15 games. And then I go to Utah, and my first year we were 41 and 41. Mm. It's the playoffs by one game. So that was my most losses ever. And after that, we won over 45 games every year. Mm. And I get traded, and I go to I go to New Jersey. Man. <laughs> yeah, how was that for you? I know there was, was a lot of star power and a lot of stuff, and they wanted it to be your team. And they did, I know there was a lot going on. It's new ownership. It was just a chaos over there. Yeah, man. I mean, it was tough. It, it got to be tough, and I, I you know, I, I, I enjoyed a lot of stuff about being in New York, about about the Nets organization. You know, I had great teammates when I was there, um, great friendships, all that. But it was tough from a basketball standpoint. Um, for me, I think looking back, I played for I played for four coaches in three and a half years. Yeah, as a point guard. You're talking about a point guard. You're talking about a point guard who just came from this system, right? That was just, you know, it was ran perfectly, coached perfectly, and then you go. And now I'm learning the new offense, the new players every single year, and it was just no consistency, and it was just hard to get into a rhythm, hard to get into that. And then I started getting injured. Mm -hmm. On top of that, I started losing confidence, and so you know. Uh, 
it just started eating at me. Just started, I really started losing losing my love for the game when I was there because it just like it just seemed like everything was going wrong. Um, yeah, and that's the exact perfect uh, wrong place for it to be going wrong in New York. Hundred percent. Tell people that all the time. Like I played four years there for the Knicks, and it it kind of goes both ways because those fans, while they can be some of the most passionate and best fans on the planet. They're very smart. They they in the know. They know about their team and what's going on with their team. But they don't – sometimes they don't have a – what do you say? Like a, a gauge to see that, 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 that these are people you're dealing with. Yeah. And it's, and it's more than just what's going on on the court in their life. And sometimes they muddy that water by just going too hard. And, I, and you know, when I was there, I used to – I didn't really care. So I used to look at it like, all right, like I get it. <laughs> you know, y'all pay y'all money for tickets and stuff. So y'all feel that y'all can say what y'all want to say. So it's hard to be a pro athlete there because if you're not a certain type of person, they can affect you. If you're the type of person that you, you know, you got thick skin and you don't really care and you can brush things off pretty easily, you you won't have that tough of a time. But like some people, I mean, we are who we are. If you if things affect you and, and they do, that's just gonna be a tough place. Yeah. So I, for me, I, I don't think I would have had a problem playing in New York. Like, I, I don't think that was the problem. I don't think like, yeah, the media was bad and, 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 and this and that. But the thing with me is like, you know, all that stuff that I used to use as fire and I would, I would, I would, I would shut it down. My body wouldn't let, wouldn't let me get back to the point where I was at. Right. And so yeah. then I couldn't, be that player I was before. It just I was, I was getting hurt, I was getting injured, I was missing games. I felt like I felt like I'm letting people down because I'm missing games, and it was just frustrating. I tell the young generation about like how you were saying you lost the love for the game, and I was telling them, like when you play in this in the NBA, when it all turned to business and stuff like that, you got to fight for your love because yeah. Like I played on every team I played for was deciding to start over. We finna rebuild. <laughs> And you gotta fight for that love, just just your love for the game, not 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 depending on anybody else. You gotta fight for your own love for the game to keep your motivation to get up and go to these gyms and get up and work out and get up and try to keep your body strong to even be out there to perform at the level that you need to be performing at. Sometimes you be in this moment like, man, I got money, all this shit. These folks act like they don't give a fuck, so I don't give a fuck. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Feel it. Hey, how was it to play at home in Dallas? I know it was, you know, it was toward the end of everything, but like I know that still had to be like a, a dope feeling, just to you know, you got your family and everything on deck. How was that for you? Yeah, that that was honestly, I, I started to get that kind of get that love back when I came back to Dallas. Right, right. Yeah. Um, you know, I just it was just a different feeling in the organization. You know, uh, a lot more stable. I feel like organization. You know, RC had been there for. You know, I'd already been there for, I don't know, like seven years. Q. Q has been there, you know, and so um, it was it was, it was was great, man, being back home. And I don't know if y'all know Dirk, but Dirk, Dirk's a good dude to play with, man. He, yeah. you don't, I don't get much better than him. Straight you know, up. As far as superstars, man, he's just, he's very humble, just, you know, he's Dirk. And, uh, you know, I enjoyed playing there. I had a lot, of, a lot of friends on the team, so, you know, it was good times being back there. How was it to get selected to the USA team and to see your teammates of like, all right, this is my group right here. Yeah. You know, we all watch the dream team. We always wanted to play for the United States and to see that now you can play with CP. Like, yeah. Now they got for both of y'all. Like, plus you got all this. Real. How was that experience for you? I mean, playing for the, I mean, playing, winning those two gold medals was obviously my biggest accomplishment as a, as a, as an athlete. Um, and, and like you said, I mean, we, when you look back now, like, you know, I'll come across people who I meet now. I'm not, I'm not a guy who just shouts out. Yeah. I played 12 years in the NBA. You know, when I meet you, I'm not, that's not, that's not my style. So half the people I meet, if they don't know who I am, I don't tell them who I am. And then yeah. they find out later and then they'll be like, damn, I would look you up and you play, you had two gold medals and you played with, and then they asked me how that was. How was it playing with Kobe? How was it playing with LeBron? How was it playing with D-Wade? You know what I'm saying? And 
just thinking of that right now, but thinking of how it's going to be, you know, 20, 30, 40 years from now, when I look right. back and be like, I played with these, with these dudes. I played with the greats, you know. I played with LeBron, who's arguably the greatest player that ever played a game, you know. And so it's definitely a, a special time. It was, a, it was an honor to represent, you know, our country um, and, and go over there and, and compete uh, for a gold medal because it's something a lot of people don't get a chance to do. I mean, there's not many people you can say, you know, they have Olympic gold medal. Yeah, I say you. I take it back to you, like you say, I'm the little chubby, doughy kid coming in that's overlooked, and then you look at it like, because that's a different level than making league. That's a different level than uh, making an all star team. That's a different level than all that. That's that's like these are the elite. Now we're gonna come in here and take the elite from the elite. You know what I'm saying? And put them on the USA team. So. That's that's like the high one of the highest honors in basketball. And then y'all went out there and took care of business all times and got gold medals. So so that's double down. Yeah, yeah. How, how fun was the basketball for you? The, the 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 conversations, just sitting on the sideline, the icing down together, the laughs, the talk about guys that you never had a conversation in your life with, yeah. which you've always admired from afar. So yeah. I was. Uh, I mean, that's that was the best part. I say it's always a camaraderie, you know, and and. You know, you guys know when you left, when you left the league, and you know you de- you damn sure miss playing, you miss competing. You, I mean, there's I still miss it. Wish I could get back out there now, but I'll get I'll get hurt walking down the street. So, <laughs> so you know, but I think the most is is after practice. You know, mm-hmm. being, in, being in that locker room for an hour, just shooting the shit, just talking, just you know. Uh, and I think that was the that was the best thing about the Olympics, you know, obviously winning the gold medal, but just the card games, you know, the meals, the bus rides, you know, we had we had two hour bus rides sometimes in some of these places. Um, just all that stuff was was just memories, man, memories that you always uh, you always cherish. And I saw something about D Way was maybe coming out with a, a like a documentary on that first team on the redeem team. Yeah. Well, I damn sure want to see that. I hope he does that. Okay. <laughs> that would be dope. Hey, I know what I want to ask. Like you, you, you like us. You came from from humble beginnings. Let's say you know humble beginnings. But when you first got to the league, you first got that that bag. What did you do to treat yourself? Did you know you I mean you older now? You retire. You can look back and say that probably wasn't the best decision. But at the time, I appreciated the hell out of it. Enjoyed the hell out of that decision. What did you do when you got the bag? <laughs> So first thing I did, uh, well, I bought my mom a house, but first thing I did for me right. was I got a, a car. I got an SUV. I got a, I went and got a Navigator. Okay. I thought this thing was the baddest thing ever. Looking back on it, this, this thing was atrocious. It was atrocious. Looking back now, now that I think about it, it was like, it was like, it was like, it was like ombre. It changed colors from the top to the bottom, you know. Man, but, you had the chameleon joint. Well, when you going? No, it wasn't and- chameleon. It wasn't chameleon. It was like silver. It's and then like changed to like darker gray down at the bottom. Well, you I didn't do the chameleon. I didn't do the chameleon paint. paint. Huh? Yeah, D wheel in that. You had D wheel in the seats and all that. So I didn't even get that far. Let me tell you why. So I bought this truck, right? This SUV, right? In Texas. Okay. This is before the. This is before the draft. Right. I'm in, Houston, I'm in Houston. I'm driving, you know, back and forth to Dallas, Houston. I get drafted by Utah. I ship it. I ship it out to Utah. This is my first time ever shipping a car. I ain't never did this shit before. So yeah. I loaded up all like when we were at the uh, the rookie symposium and the rookie photo shoot, all that. I had all my memorabilia. I had signed by everybody. You know what I'm saying? I had all that stuff. I put it in the back. No. I didn't I didn't ship it enclosed. I didn't ship it enclosed, right? Oh, I hear where this is going. It already. gets to it gets to to Utah, and I go in there. I'm getting. My, I'm going to. I'm about to pull all my stuff. Out. I go in there. It's empty. And there's nothing broken. There's no windows broken. So it had to be the, the the driver, but it also says on the contract they're not responsible for anything on the inside of the car. There, wow. there you have it. Wow. Driver so that's not the worst. That's not the worst part though. So all this happens. All this happens, right? So my house in Utah is up on the, it's like, when you're when you're in Salt Lake, it's looking over like downtown. It's yeah. like the last row of houses before you, you turn the corner of the mountain. Yeah. So it's uphill. So winter hits, 
right? And I'm going to get up this hill and it's snowing. And I'm, I can't get up the hill. I'm like, why can't I get this damn SUV? Why can't I get up the hill? Man, it's two wheel drive, man. I didn't even know it. <laughs> I thought all SUVs was all wheel drive. I don't want no bad, man. <laughs> uh, I don't know no bad. You can't get up the hill with that shit. <laughs> Oh, the two-wheel drive uh, navigator. <laughs> That's funny. That is crazy. That's crazy. <laughs> That's crazy. So that's why you look back on that purchase and say that was just all bad. Because I had to get rid of it. The next day I went down and bought a G-Wagon. Oh, that was okay. perfect. That's a little upgrade, you know, it's all upgrade. good. <laughs> So when you was coming up, like, who's the guys you like emulated after? Who's them guys that you was like, man, I want to be like that person, or that that they took AI you? earlier? Heard you say AI, that. Yeah. J, J Kid, J Kid, um, you know, uh, Gary Payton, Love Uncle Jim. Uh, uh, with a, like the main two was 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 GP and and, and Kid, you know, because they were bigger point guards. Um, you know, they weren't the fastest, they weren't the quickest. Uh, Bay Area boys. GP was, GP was kind of fast. But, uh, you know, they just, uh, their games kind of resonated with mine. Um, you know, everybody wanted to be AI, AI back then, though. You know, right. You just couldn't do it. Everybody can't be AI. <laughs> um, you know, but even before them, because like I said, I was a student in the game. So, I, you know, I watched, I watched Magic. I watched John. Um, man. Steph. Steph, Steve, Steve Francis. Franchise, boy. Steve Francis was a problem. BD. Problem. BD. Yeah. I, was, I was a big BD fan. Yeah. Um, man, I liked, I liked watching all the big guards. Yeah. I, 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 let, let me ask you this, speaking of that, big guards, right? Start, bench, cut. Let's go Gilbert Arenas, mm -hmm. Baron Davis, and mm -hmm. Steve Francis. Mm, that's good. That's good. We talk, and we talking about it's all. In, we talking it's about our, all in their primes. All prime. It's our era. These dudes we played against and all that. You got you 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 came in as a young boy we against. Talking about, we talking about, we're talking about offense only. No, everything no. total package. Whatever you guys see, all of, them was, all of them was held on wow. wheels and they primed every last one of them. Stevie was a was a monster. Boom Dizzle was a monster, and we know what Agent Zero was. Man, I might have to start Agent Zero. Ooh. That man's a problem, bro. A serious he problem. Oh, like he would have stayed healthy. Oh my gosh, you might have been talking about him as one of the best to ever do it. Record books, yeah. Man, people don't realize. Man gave me well, he gave me fifty, but it was a lot of it was on D Fish. <laughs> oh, that's the game. Remember that, remember that game that he had on the. Uh, when he he shot on the on the, uh, on the game, yeah, he walked away. Turn around, that was on me. <laughs> yeah, that was on me. I all up in his face. Hey, this is great. I remember that when you said it, like, yeah. <laughs> God damn it, man! My hand was all in his shit. Hey, he walked it off. <laughs> so I'm gonna start. I'm gonna start. I see it. I see it now. Stevie Franchise was a, he was a beast. Damn, man, you gonna make me cut BD? <laughs> you gonna make me cut my boy? Okay, do it. You gonna bench? Franchise, you gonna, you gonna cut BD? I don't want to. Boom, you know <laughs> <laughs> I love you, bro. Hey. Uh, <sighs> It. <laughs> it's tough though. I mean, it's like not even like a night and day. Like, it ain't like one's clear cut. No, it's like night and day. <laughs> <laughs> no, we gonna we gonna we gonna we gonna bench BD. We gonna cut. We gonna cut Stevie. All right. Well, I got I got a, a today's one for you. You know, since you're OG now. Today's today. Okay. Yo, fella. Oh yeah, get okay. used to that now. You are, you are OG now. That show no okay. okay. you now. We <laughs> all OGs now. Just, just he was trying to fight it. He ain't want to let it marinate and get up in his spirit. But now he didn't let. He didn't got called it too many times. Where he just had to just live with it. Uh, yep. So, yep. Start bitch cut. Uh, Kyrie, 
mm-hmm. Dame Lillard, Steph, Steph Curry. Ooh. Who would you start? Who would you bench? Who would you cut? I'm gonna start. I'm gonna start Steph. I'm gonna bench Dame. I'm gonna cut Reed. Mm, that was real easy. What? Well, can we get a little elaboration? It is, but it's not. And and I have these conversations a lot. That's why I can. That's why I can. <laughs> I can like say that one so quickly. And it ain't yeah. it ain't that easy. Trust me, it yeah. ain't that easy. I think Kyrie's the most talented out of all of them. Maybe mm-hmm. like natural talent, but Steph is just a problem. Like, and you can shoot like that, and, 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 <laughs> and, and, and yeah. And then Dame, I'm just a fan. I just I just love Dame's game. And his, and his demeanor and his just everything. I just like I just like I just like him as a, as a person. I know I got I got a good one, a star bench cut. This is like of the guys who would have who would have been crazier if they never got hurt. I already know he gonna say G Hill. Yep. Kenny. Yep. T Mac. And T Mac. All like Penny, Penny, Penny start. Ooh, okay. He's saying Penny would have been the one out of the. Ooh, okay. G Hill. You gonna yeah. cut the Mac? Oh, That's really? Good. Penny, G Hill, then T back. I'm gonna answer this one. I think I might have went. I think I think I might have had to start T Mac. I'm mm-hmm. start back too. Penny. <laughs> Penny. And then G Hill, but I respect it. You can't go wrong with this. T-Mac couldn't get my name right when we played him in the playoffs. So he he holds a, a special. Who did? T-Mac, he, he kept calling me Duran in the playoffs. Oh, I should it let it, I should let it go. It was 2006. There you have it. <laughs> there you have it. That was a dispute before we got on. Like, is it Dan or Duran? I said, man, I call him D-Will. I don't even have to wor- worry about all that. Look, I bypassed all that. But he just settled it. It is very not the run. I uh I know you you've been watching today's game and you see how the kind of how it kind of changed and how it sped up a little bit more. Yeah. What do you think about like the point guards these days? Everybody got one. You, you know, like so. How how do you think about the era of the point guard now? That's strong when you play. That's strong. I tell you that much. I feel like when I honestly when I feel like in my prime. I felt like the point guard position was tough. That's what people always ask me. Like it was like no nights off. Yeah. It was no nights off. Even like the guys who weren't really the superstars could still give you just work. Just, man, if you didn't, you thought you had a night off, then you, know, you were wrong. <laughs> um, but now, if I feel like every every damn near every team got a superstar point guard. That's what it feel like, at least. Yep. Somebody with the chip. They all they're all skilled, they can all shoot. You know, there's not many there's not many point guards that can't shoot anymore. No, nah, they come now. The thing is I could do everything. I yeah. could shoot, I could cross you up and drop you and I dunk on you. Because like, I remember that's, new, that's the, the new lane they coming in. <laughs> and I was I was talking to somebody the other day about uh when I when uh when Kyle Lowry and um and um and Mike Conley were in Memphis together. I was there. I used to bet. I would not guard them. I was in the, in the middle. I was in the free throw line, behind the free throw line with both of them. You hardly do that to none of these guys yeah, today. I can't do that to them now. Then both of them are cash, it's yeah. cash money. I, obviously, I mean, you know, obviously, but that, that just shows you how the time has changed. Like, that's how yeah. most vets do. Once they get certain length, like, they're going to be serviceable or just be able to shoot it. But, like, yeah. these dudes walking in the dope range rovers. Yeah. I'm around all these boys. I could cross you. I could dunk on you. And I shoot it, float it, lay it, do whatever you want me to do, however you want me to do it. And then I'm like, man, you, you watch the next one, like, all this life. You see these little dudes just coming. Yeah. <laughs> you know, coming yeah. like, yo, what? Like, jumping. Well, they all, they all still, they all see stuff. Man, that he take. Look, change the game. Say what they want about all the debates. But the one thing they have to give him his flowers on, he changed the entire game. He yeah. changed it from where everybody, you know, everybody wanted to dunk. Everybody like, man, please. He made it for real change. But now I want to pull up, be just two steps inside half court and like hit the three from deep and be able to be outside. Like now they feel like they the feature. <laughs> they the, the little guard say I could be a star now because of what he doing. He ain't got he ain't dunking on nobody. He out here pop bopping everybody. <laughs> yep. John Morant's the next one though. Hey, yeah. 
Young that, boy. That, that young fella, that young fella can ball. Hey, listen, he one of my favorite young ones to watch, but he's special and he ain't scared of the moment for nothing. At all. I wanted to uh, ask you about uh, like uh, Kobe Bryant, like, cause you play, being in the West, you play so many games every year against the Lakers and Kobe Bryant, meet them in the playoffs, different situations. How was it for you to uh, have them, them challenges and them games against Kobe? Now, I feel like he's personally responsible for me not having a championship. <laughs> I, feel like, I feel like there was a couple teams in the in the East that, I mean, I, feel, I don't feel like a couple of those years that we lost to them, we lost, I think, three years in a row. I don't think there was anybody in the East that could have beat us in a, in a, in a seven-game series. But because of that man, <laughs> didn't get a chance. Didn't even, didn't even, didn't even come to that. <laughs> we didn't even get to the Western Conference Finals. But... Uh, no nah, man, he, he was a, he was a, he was special. He was yeah. a special, special, uh, a special man, man. He, uh, he was the closest thing to Jordan, I think, that there that there ever will be. Um, with his his passion on both ends of the floor, his competitiveness, you know, just a just a just a killer, the savage, hands down. What is your take on just seeing the the NBA put on the bubble and how they were able to pull that off without a you know without a snafu, no testing, you know nobody had positive tests, and more importantly, how do you feel and how do you view the Utah Jazz and Donovan Mitchell and Rudy and them guys what they were doing and the type of show that 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 the Donovan put on? What do you yeah. think of the current team and what they're doing with those guys? Well, I think, I think number one, the, the bubble. I, when it, when they had the idea, I was like, "There's no way this thing's gonna work." I was like, "They're gonna get out there for like two weeks." You and me both. And everybody gonna have Corona, and then they gonna have to send everybody home. I was like, "They just want to get that, you know, that those first whatever to finish that regular season." Yeah. And they going, they gonna get up out of there. I was super impressed to to not only have the season, but now one right case. That was unbelievable. Michelle Roberts, Adam Silver, and any and everybody else that had anything to do with it, and all the people that were down there. So, I mean, obviously, people being down here, it was it was a difficult scenario. But I mean, for them to pull it off like that was. But then for all the players that you know that that stayed and did it, I mean, that's 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 tough to be away from your families for that long to to make that sacrifice, especially you know the Lakers and the and the Heat, you know. Man. What three four months without without seeing their family? So, you know, a lot of respect to them. A lot of respect to the NBA for being able to put that put that on. I mean, that's incredible during this climate. Yeah. Um. And then as far as the Jazz, I mean, Donovan's a he's another one that's, <laughs> that's special. I mean, he reminds me of D Wade. Baby D Wade. Reminds me of D Wade. He's like man. I was I thought he was like six five, and I I seen him at the game. I went to the Jazz game. Like bro, I'm like an inch taller than you right now. <laughs> Boy plays elevated above that. Man, <laughs> his bounce is stupid if he's six six two. <laughs> but uh, no, his game is 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 improving. You can see it just just proving. You can see that confidence, that confidence you talk about. He's got it, you know. And so it's about just uh, you know putting the right people around him. I think you know. I think they got a solid team. I think Gobert's solid. Yeah. Uh, you know they they got some good pieces, but I think it's especially with, with these these super teams. I think they need one more one more piece. Yeah. One more star. One more one more go getter. Yeah. They they definitely they definitely look good. I think Mike Conley, if he get a you know a few more, a little bit more time down there to kind of figure out his, where he need to fit in there. I think gotta really more, Mike gotta be more aggressive. Yeah. He be more aggressive. I feel mm-hmm. like he, I feel like he defers which I mean, it's hard not to when you got a player like that. Yeah, yeah. I, I feel like he came in trying to make sure that the kid was comfortable. And yeah, next year I think he'll be he'll be ready to go. Because like when Mike was Mike was in uh, Memphis. Memphis, like you know, Ta was the two guard. Was, you know, it was never like a a two guard who was out there scoring twenty five a game, thirty a game. Mm-hmm. Like so it's that's a different when you don't got the ball in your hands as much. Yeah, you know, be as effective. You know, your rhythm's a little off. You don't have that same that same feel. You know, for the game. 
Yeah. What did you think when you were watching that as you watched that that duel between him and Murray? I mean, I I, I know everybody like like I was sitting there just in simple simply amazed by the way both of them were just going. It was like a for real AAU game, both every time. You know what also I was thinking? Ain't nobody playing no damn defense in this bubble. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> they said that quickly. They said that quickly. It was no D B in play, boy. But that being said, that, 50, that being said, fifty is fifty. You still got to put that thing in the hole fifty times. Or not fifty hey, times, but hey, you know what I mean? in the book. Hey, it's the game. Make sure you got them in the book. <laughs> That's it. Was crazy to see them to see them go back and forth like that. Jamal's might have been more impressive because they came back in that series and, and one, yeah, on his on his fifty point games. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. That is true. Yeah. I want to ask you about uh, one of my guys that uh, that played with y'all. Man, I used to love watching him play. AK forty seven, Andre Karolinko. Like, how was that to play with AK? Man, he's such a good. Dude. He's such a good dude, man. Um, no, nah, he was the best, man. Uh, he's just one of the players who just he didn't really. He didn't really need the ball to be effective. He was going to – that ball – he found that ball. Yeah, play defense. His fill, up, cut. Fill, up, fill up a stat sheet, you know. Never stop moving. I hated Gordon. Uh, yeah. Never stop moving. The only <laughs> thing is if he could have if he could have found a consistent jumper. Offense. I was about to say, I could care less about him on the offensive end. He yeah. was my worst defensive matchup. Uh, well, me being on offense and him defending me, him and Tayshawn Prince was the worst matchups of my entire career. <laughs> my entire career, those two long, oh, the motherfucker, they block. Uh, you know me, I'm posting up, getting, but like neither one of them was strong enough to stop me. But I could, uh, I could do all of that. They just wait, they just wait. As soon as I go up, extend. I'm longer than you, young fella. <laughs> like, look, look, I'm longer than you. We not young fella. We the same age, but like, I'm good. I, I hated them too. If I had a good game against. Either one of them, I was good. I was good for a long time because they was tough for me to get off on. No lie. Yep. Nah, he was he was tough, man, on that defensive end. Locks, rebounds, steals. Tough. Who in the NBA now that you that that, that you kind of see flashes with you? Hmm. Uh He's a little smaller than me, but uh, no, I ain't gonna say that because people say he looks like me too. Van Fleet. Van <laughs> Fleet. <laughs> That's my guy. He's, he's, got that, he's, got that, he's got that. He's got that shiftiness, man. He's got that. You know, he, he's got that change of direction. I, I kind of see uh, yeah. when I watch him. Tough as hell, too. So I think that. Yeah, I think he'd be he one. Got that Illinois right to left. Yeah. <laughs> yo 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 that's a wrap man that was love we appreciate you pulling up on us d will y'all check it out man this was a special one we appreciate you d appreciate y'all having me man